So welcome to another edition of Open for Business. And today we have a very special guest, Coach Roy Austin. Thank you for being on Open for Business, Roy. Thank you for having me, Marjorie. It's a pleasure. So guys, you are in for a real treat. Not only does this guy have a CPA, he's got an MBA, and he helps small businesses do better business. And you tell me about the book that you just came out with. Well, Marjorie, the, the book came about um, through all the business coaching I've been doing for the last 10 years. And one of the things that I noticed was that most small businesses get in trouble because they don't understand the accounting side. And in a lot of cases, they ignore the accounting side because it's not something they enjoy doing or they understand. Uh, and that usually gets them in trouble. So I started buying books that were, quote, uh, accounting for non-numbers people. Hmm. About eight of them. They were horrible. Uh, I couldn't imagine any of my clients getting past page two. Uh, so I thought, eventually, I thought, well, maybe I can do a better job of this um, and make it a little bit more engaging. And But as I got into the project, I realized that small businesses needed help, not just with accounting, but with all the major business functions, because most of them have never been through business college or had an MBA or anything like that. So, you know, it's marketing, it's HR, it's hiring, it's managing. All of your background. All those different functions. And so it eventually evolved into essentially a user's manual or success guide, if you will, uh, to help small businesses uh, understand the basics. It's not designed to be a comprehensive marketing guide or, you know, accounting course, but as long as you understand um, enough so that you know where to look, what to look for, and how to use the information. Gosh, I wish I wish we were actually live and so small businesses could uh, pose their questions to you. But you know, I'm so excited to to be hearing some of these tips and advice from you because that's what Open for Business is all about. But before we get to the tips and advice. You've also been very busy. You're an ambassador of the, of the Bluffton Chamber of Commerce. Um, and your latest endeavor is the library, the library for Kids International. Right. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, a year ago, September, I went to Africa. I had always wanted to see the animals in the wild while they're still in the wild. Yeah. And... Um, the tour included lots of visits to homes and schools and villages and churches and markets and so forth. I didn't care about that. All I wanted to do was see the animals in the wild. Uh, and if I had to put up with all this cultural stuff, so be it. But a funny thing happened. Uh, I really came to enjoy getting to know and talking with the African people, uh, hearing their stories and particularly sitting down in the schools with the kids who all spoke English. Um, and, you know, you, you're, I was so impressed at how anxious they were and excited to learn. Um, they, school was a privilege. It's not something, oh, I got to go to school. Uh, they're excited to get to school. And um, we were visiting one school in Amboseli National Park in Kenya. And one of the people in our group asked the teacher, do you have a library? And she said, well, no, but we'd love to. And, you know, I couldn't get that out of my head. And I kept thinking, well, surely we can get some books donated and ship them over there. So when I got home, I started working on this project. And the first thing I think uh, it, it, that I ran into was a number of people that told me, forget it. Can't be done. Books are too expensive. They'll never get through customs, so forth. Well, one of my philosophies of life has been for a long time, focus on the objective, not the obstacle. And I see a lot of small businesses doing that or people that want to start a small business and they'll think, well, if I start this, I'll have all these problems. Well, you know, anything worthwhile is going to have problems. So don't focus on the problems focus on the objective that you're trying to accomplish. That's a great tip. I'm a, I'm a big believer in contrary opinions. And so when somebody says they don't think it's a good idea, that should force you to reevaluate and think about it. Um, but 
just to say can't be done is a different situation. Uh, and there were obstacles. Um, you know, books are expensive to ship over there. But we found that if you mail them through the post office, it's a fraction of the cost of uh, shipping it by FedEx. Um, we found that customs over there is not interested in used books. There's no black market for used books. And so they have gotten through to schools and, and people in Tanzania and Nairobi. And uh, we will now ship to three schools. I'm getting ready to ship to a fourth school. Uh, they're all packed up. I'm just waiting for some information from them. Where are you getting the books from, Roy? The books are donated, and we send every school a set of encyclopedias, uh, and along with a lot of other books. But the first thing we want to get them is a, a set of is encyclopedias because essentially that's Google to them. They don't have the internet. Wow. And and yes, some some information is outdated in the encyclopedias. But the vast majority of it is still relevant, uh, and it gives them a resource. Because let me give you a good story. The, the lady that created our website, who is Kenya, uh, and lives over there near Nairobi, I asked her, I said, why are you such an enthusiastic volunteer for this project? And she said to me, well, when I was in primary school, which over there is grades one through eight, um, she said, there were 30 to 40 kids in my class. Hmm. We all shared one textbook. They had one English book, one Swahili book, and one math book. And they all had to share it. And she's been going around and collecting stories from other students and teachers, and this is a, not an untypical situation. You might have five to 10 kids sharing a book. Well, if you can imagine that, <laughs> Uh, it, that's real competitive, but um, that's why they're so excited to to learn. And to I school. love your um, subtitle on it: creating the future leaders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Roy, really, what you've done is real leadership. You saw a problem, and you're you're solving it. Well, actually, that slogan didn't come from me. It came from a, another fella in Kenya who I found that uh, created the logo. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came up with that slogan, and I thought, wow, that's just perfect. Uh, so that's we're wonderful. we're making great project progress, and it has grown much farther and much faster than I ever would have imagined. So before we get into the tips and advice on Open for Business, you know, if somebody's interested in getting involved with your, with your organization, um, the nonprofit, <clears throat> what do they need to do? Where can they donate books? I would say the best thing is to go to our website, which is libraries, the number four, kids.org, and you can click on the contact us button and, and email me. Um, but that's probably the easiest. It's just the uh, libraries, the number four kids.org. Very good. Very good. Well, I'll have to, we'll have to do another interview and find out how it goes this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, so let's, let's talk about small business. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that I get to interview a CPA and an MBA. So um, what, is the number one reason small businesses fail. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier. Number one, I would put up there with uh, not understanding the numbers, not understanding the accounting side. And you don't need to be an expert. You don't have to be an accountant, but you need to understand enough so that you can ask intelligent questions of whoever's doing your accounting. Uh, For seen... instance, let's, let's pretend we have a car mechanic shop or something. I'll give you a good example. I had one client and uh, he uh, needed uh, a set of financial statements to get a bank loan. And I went and looked at his QuickBooks and there was nothing in it, just re revenues and receivables. So I thought, well, okay, we can, from his bank records and his credit card statements, we can recreate his books, but we need to reconcile his bank statements. Uh, so we know how much money we got to start with. 
So I said, who, who reconciles your bank statement? And he said, well, my CPA does that. So I contacted the CPA. And he called me back a couple of years, days later and he said, well, you know, I've been really busy. I haven't reconciled the bank statement in three years. Now, who's, whose fault is that? It's actually a small business owner, I think. It's the owner, yeah. yeah. You don't have to, to be a rocket scientist to know that you should be asking your, your whoever's doing your accounting for bank reconciliations every month, for a set of financial statements every month. If you don't understand something in the financial statements, you ask. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, again, you don't have to be a... Uh, 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 an accountant to to know when something is wrong. I had another fellow who was uh, asked me to take a look at his QuickBooks, and he we pulled it up, and he showed year against year. And I said, well, let's expand that and look at it month by month. And he said, well, you can do that. <laughs> I said, yeah. So we looked at it month by month, scrolled down through his expenses, and there was one line item that was three thousand dollars a month exactly every month until November. And then in November, it was 12,000. And I asked him, I said, what happened in November? He said, well, I don't know. So let's drill down and find out. Well, there was a one-time expense that had been coded to the wrong place. Now, and so fortunately, there was no fraud involved. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to be an accountant to know that when you see a blip like that, there's something wrong. There's a question that needs to be asked. So that's a really good tip is check your financials monthly, if not weekly, yeah. and compare them month to month and year to year. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, it, it's not a matter of being an expert in accounting. It's just knowing where to look, what to look for, and, and how to use the information. So, you know, one of the big complaints about accountants or CPAs or bookkeepers is sometimes the small business owners they don't really understand the difference right and like you'll have a cpa do all your books mm -hmm. but they also but they don't really do tax financial planning unless they have that degree but um you know when you go to ask for financial advice you would think a cpa would give it to you but some do but in one of my complaints and I like to pick on my CPA friends is they focus almost exclusively on taxes. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they go hand in hand. I wish more accountants would. They, they go hand in hand, but a lot of times, um, you should, well, you should never let tax strategy override business strategy. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, had somebody who, wanted to save on taxes, their CPA said, well, you know, buy some equipment. You, you can write it off. So they went out and bought a $375,000 piece of equipment, which wow. they borrowed the money for. Um, I found out about it about a month after they did it. They did it on December 30th, thinking they could take $375,000 in bonus depreciation. Well, but they didn't take possession of the equipment until January. So they couldn't write it off. Uh, so when I found out about it, I said, well, how much revenue do you expect to bring in? And they said, oh, this is gonna open doors for us. Well, two years later, it hadn't brought in any revenue. And they decided maybe we, we just need to sell it and hopefully we can get back out of it what we paid for. It. And then of course we said, well, you realize you just, you took all the depreciation in year two. If you sell it now, you have to recapture that. We do. Well, the, the CPA was telling them how they could save money on taxes, but didn't take into consideration what is the business strategy of this business? You know, the owner had just asked, how can I save money? And they answered. But in the larger context, uh, this piece of equipment did not fit with their strategy. So what would you have told that business owner if they had contacted you first? I would have said, all right, how much revenue is this thing going to bring in? I mean, are, you, gonna, are you going to be able to get, I mean, how are you going to do that? Just saying it'll open doors for us is not an answer. Uh, how, how would you predict that? I think you, you got to 
to have looked at the at the business and say, all right, who's going to use this? What do we need this for? Mm -hmm. um, how is it going to help us? Um, you know, you, you see stuff like people go out and they'll buy an eighty thousand dollar pickup when a twenty thousand dollar pickup will will do the job. Well, um, so I, what's the rule on that at the end of the year? Like you can write off how much if well, you if you do buy a truck. Bonus, yeah, depreciation and bonus tax deductions change every year, so you do need to get your your CPAs and advice in that. Uh, but if your CPA is not advising you on your business strategy uh, and only looking at your tax strategy, you need to get somebody else to take a look at it also. What percentage of accountants CPAs do both of that? I, you know, that's, that's a, a good question, but I really don't know. I, I know of one that is pretty good at that because he was a, a former chief financial officer for a large corporation. So he He's understands. Got yeah. But a lot of CPAs, you know, they went to college, they, they got the accounting education, they passed the CPA exam, and all they've ever done is taxes. So I love this tip. Mm -hmm. Find a CPA mm -hmm. that also has a business background that will give you some business strategy. And when you ask them about saving taxes or anything else, you, you want to have, say, let's sit down and talk about it in the context of my overall business strategy. What am I trying to accomplish next year? Uh, does this fit with my goal? Uh, is this providing a, you know, was that piece of equipment providing a service that customers have told me that they needed? Mm -hmm. uh, so what advice do you have on business strategies with it being the end of the year now? What would you tell small business owners on how to prepare for the next year? <laughs> well, yeah, this is the time when we all set goals, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're sitting down, and uh, probably a lot of your listeners have heard the term SMART goal. Uh, is the goal specific? Is it measurable? Is it achievable? Is it relevant? And is it time-bound? Do I have a deadline for accomplishing it? And a lot of times it'll be, well, I'm going to grow revenue 20% or something like that. Now, there's something missing from that SMART acronym. Because a lot of times when I ask people, say, well, how are you going to grow revenues 20% next year? And the answer is, well, I'm going to work harder. Or, you know, something like that. You got to add an S onto the SMART acronym. What's the strategy? How are you going to accomplish the goal? Can you think of uh, an example right off the top of your head? Yeah, I got a, a couple of them. Okay. Um, let's say my goal is to get up at 6.30 tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Is that specific? Mm -hmm. Like measurable? Is it attainable? Is it relevant? If I don't get up at 6.30, I, may, I don't make my appointments. And it's got a time deadline on it. What's the strategy? Is a very... You just okay, wonderful. You you okay. set the alarm. Yeah. Uh, Go to another, bed. <laughs> another more humorous example is uh, um, many years ago, I was home on leave from the army, and my father took me to his annual Christmas luncheon with his buddies. And uh, we sat down at the table, and the waiter came to take the drink orders, and the man across the table from me ordered five Manhattans. And the waiter came and lined up five Manhattans in front of him. And I was fascinated because I, I, I was thinking, you know, what's going on here? So finally he got up and, and left and I turned to my father and I said, Dad, what's, what's the deal with Mr. Bear and the five Manhattans? And he said, well, Lee figures that he can drink five and still be sober enough to drive home. But if he orders them one at a time, he loses count. Oh, dear. <laughs> So strategy, what, what, <laughs> strategy. When 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 they're when he's drunk the five of them and they're gone, it's time to go home. <laughs> so that tip would be be much more specific for your strategy. Right. Action mm -hmm. items. List out everything you need to do to obtain it. Yeah. Yep. 
So what you want to get, if we could talk about HR, do you have any advice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm just so excited to be talking to a CPA and an MBA and somebody mm -hmm. who's run their own business and you know, on the HR side, you know, we, we are in a labor market right now that's got a, lot, a shortage of, of people. Uh, when I go to my BNI meetings, I hear it all the time. I can't find people or I'm looking for new people or whatever. Um, and that's, you know, it is tough. But it's important to find the right people. Right. Uh, not just a body to fill a slot. What is the process for that? May, that might be a good question. You, you, you just, that's the whole first section of my book. <laughs> because you want to find people who are excited about your vision for the future. They believe in your mission. Uh, they, How do you uh, tell that though, Roy? Mm -hmm. How do you tell that they're excited? Is it the, what they say? Their body language? Is it a... Well, you, usually when, when people are interviewed, they're asked what? about their experience and right. their education, okay, which is great. But whoever asks questions about, you know, this is my vision, you know, how do you see yourself fitting into it? This is our mission. Is that something that, that excites you? These are our values, you know, or, and find, try to find out what their values are, are the two in sync. Uh, would you be comfortable operating in our culture, which is, I define it in the book as operating principles. This is the way we do things here. But you, you structure questions around those things, what I call your business fundamentals, your vision, your mission, your uh, values, and your operating principles to find out. Uh, and then, you know. Great insight. Great. It, mm, so it, so uh, on the opposite end, how do you know when to let an employee go and what mistakes do small business owners do in that scenario? Well, of course, that letting somebody go is never easy. And uh, the few times that I've had to do it, it was very unpleasant, uh, both for me and for the, for the person. Um, sometimes it becomes necessary because of economic circumstances of the business and sometimes it becomes necessary because of the person uh, i always used to tell my staff i expect you to make mistakes okay i make mistakes we're all human we all make mistakes i ex also expect you to learn from those mistakes and not make them again and tell me how you're going to prevent the mistake from happening in, in the future um if you try to hide your mistake from me now we got a problem yeah. uh come and admit it and you know admittedly it took a while for people to believe that i was sincere about this and they but were after a while they, they became comfortable with you know roy's not gonna you know reprimand me or demote me or fire me if i admit that i made a mistake mm -hmm. but i think that uh is important and uh i think you also, uh, it's hard enough to find good employees, but when you find the one that's a star, you want to keep them uh, because the stars have opportunities to go wherever they want to go. And there's lots of job openings for people that are really good. Your mediocre and particularly your poor performers will never leave because nobody wants them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how are you going to keep those stars? Well, a yeah, what are the strategies? Times, a lot of times, those stars, uh, and, and I'm thinking of a, one person in particular who moved from Texas back here to Bluffton because he believed in the, in the vision of the owner of the business. He had worked for them before. He, was, he loved their mission. He shared their values, and he liked working in their culture or under their operating principles. He was willing to take less money. Uh, to do something that he loved with people that he loved doing it with. And I think that's the way you keep your, you know, you've got a better chance of keeping your stars if they have bought in to who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Excellent. Great. And more great insight. Let's talk about sales. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a salesperson 
that works just on commission? How do you, are industries all different of how, how much commission they keep? I think every industry and every company has a different structure. Some are commission, some are salary, some are salary plus commission. I think, uh, and I'm thinking of one particular situation where when this guy was being interviewed for a sales position, he said, he told him right up front, I, I don't work under commission. Uh, you know, either pay me a salary or, you know, I'll, I'll work somewhere else. Okay. To me, that's a red flag. A really good salesperson. A really good salesperson would say, "Yeah, I want some. I want to get commission." Mm -hmm. um, small business owners sometimes are reluctant to pay commissions because they're afraid that the salesperson will make more money than they do. You want them to make more money than you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they're making more money than you are, they are contributing a lot of money to your bottom line. Absolutely. Which is, which is going to make you more money. I mean, a good sales course person could, should bring in three to four times what they're being paid. And a lot of really good ones are probably bring in 10 times what they're being paid. So I've heard anywhere from 6% to 50%. Mm -hmm. What have you heard? I don't, I, I can't, you know, really haven't heard that Marjorie. So, uh, Again, it's it's going to be industry specific. You know, six percent commission on a hundred thousand dollar sale is one thing. Six percent on a hundred dollar sales is not too exciting. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I I don't know that there's one hard, you know, a rule of thumb there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about marketing. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest mistakes small business owners make when mm -hmm. it comes to marketing? I, I, it's funny, I get people that come to me and they'll say, I've got this great idea and people really need it. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that's good. You do want something that people need. However, the real question is, do they want it? Let me give you an example. All of us need an estate plan. Uh, you know, uh, none of us are immortal, so sooner or later we're going to go uh, to the other side, so to speak. But how many of us have one? Well, I can do that later. It costs money to hire a lawyer. I mean, there's all kinds of excuses. I've got other things that need to take priority. It's something that we all need, but it's not something that we either want or we want right now. Or, yeah. I and um, you know the the often that product that somebody's excited about that they feel like people need is yeah I've talked to a few friends and they thought it was a great idea you know when you talk to your friends what you want to find is somebody that thinks it's a bad idea great insight because when you talk to somebody that says hey Marjorie that's a great idea what have you learned nothing Nothing. Just confirmed what you already right. are. Right. So, okay, you know, that boosts your ego and your confidence a little bit. But you want to find somebody who doesn't think it's a good idea because that should force you to think. Mm -hmm. And and you reevaluate and, and uh, take a look at your situation. Another thing that's un unrealistic is people don't do enough research to find out how many people would be interested or want your product. So how would you go about doing that if you had one of these estate planning companies? Mm -hmm. What would be the first steps? Well, the, the you know, the, you, you've got, I mean, we've got the great resource now of Google. Uh, so you've got all kinds of opportunities to try to evaluate the size of your market. Mm -hmm. If there are not enough people that need it, let alone want it, uh, there's no point in going any farther. Uh, so you, you uh, I mean, there's expensive ways to do it and hiring market research consultants and all that sort of stuff, but um, you can gain a tremendous amount of information just by spending time uh, researching it on the internet uh, to find out how big this market is. If it's, you know, uh, is it something that's just for urban consumers that live within a two block area, uh, you know, maybe. Maybe that's not such a great idea. 
be interesting to see how many people on Google actually search um, those terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it 100 a month or is it 10,000 a yeah. month? I mean, that would be, that would be interesting insight too. Well, there's no shortage of information out there. Uh, so it, it, you can, in some cases, you can almost get overwhelmed by it. Uh, right. But you, you got to do the research. You, you got to figure out, are there, is there anybody else? How many people need it? Where are they? Who are they? You know, what does your target market look like? Um, you know, are they men or women? Are they multiracial? Are they, are, you know, only within one particular small location or are they uh, uh, countrywide? Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that's going to depend on the type of business that you want to build. One of the things that I think I found was, uh, most business books are designed for mega corporations. Um, there's a few really good ones out there, like E-Myth Revisited, that is oh, designed for that. small businesses. But most of them are designed for large corporations. Now, and the assumption is that everybody who starts a business wants to become a mega corporation. And I don't buy that. I don't either, Roy. I think the vast majority of, of people that start a business they start it because they know how to do the work, you know, and then they find out doing the work and running a business are two different skill sets, but they're not interested in being huge. They may want to, you know, expand some in their own local area, but basically they want to learn a, earn a nice living for their family, uh, make a contribution to their community mm -hmm. uh, and do something that they love doing. Yep. So, you know, that leads me to the next question. Small business owners can be consumed by small business. Mm -hmm. and how, what are the best strategies for um, balancing family with mm -hmm. small business? Yeah. If there are. You know, it's interesting. One of the companies that I interviewed for the book, because I, I interviewed 18 small businesses, it was, you know, the emphasis w was on small business. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, knowing and working with small businesses, I know that they don't have much time to read. So I intentionally made the chapter short. I, you know, interjected humor stories, particularly stories from all the 18 companies that I interviewed and a lot of graphics. Um, the publisher told me, don't put color graphics in here. That's a waste of money. And I said, nope, we're, we're putting it in there because I think it makes the book more entertaining. Um, but um, the now now I lost my train of thought on your question. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about balance. Balance. One of the companies I interviewed was a calf killer brewery in Sparta, Tennessee. And uh, fascinating story about all the people that told them it couldn't be done. Uh, Sparta was in a White County, Tennessee, which is a dry county, uh, and it took them about eight years before they finally got up and running. And they have a very unique philosophy about their beer. Um, but I asked them, I said, what has been the biggest challenge in this? And I was expecting to say, you know, all the regulatory hoops they had to jump through or raising the money to, to do things. And Dave and Don Sergio said, no, it's balancing our work and our family life. Because he said, we could, we are so consumed and enjoy this so much. We could be brewing beer all day long, and, <laughs> uh, you know, and trying out new recipes and new, new ways of doing things. Uh, so it is, it is a tough thing, but. How did they solve that? I, I think they just, you know, one of my time management principles is you make appointments with yourself. Talk more about that. That's okay. a, another great tip insight. Yeah, I mean, um, you do have to maintain a balance. Well, and you've got all kinds of forces that are pulling at you from all over the place. Uh, you know, the phone rings and emails come in and texts come in and people stop by your office and before you know it, the whole day's shot and you haven't gotten accomplished. I think it's important to, to make appointments with yourself, whether it's to work on the business or you say, okay, you know, at five o'clock or whatever, you know, however your work schedule is, the office is closed. Uh, it can wait till tomorrow. 
And, you know, I was guilty when I first started doing business coaching 10 years ago. You know, I'm popping up to the, every time I hear an email come in or something, I'm popping up to look at it and uh, all excited. And find, you know, you finally come to the realization that 98% of this stuff can wait till tomorrow. Yeah. It's not urgent and critical that you answer it or do it right now. Uh, but you will wind up in trouble if you're not balancing your family with your business. Uh, how did they end up balancing it? Did they did they schedule time for family or? You know, uh, I, I think basically that's what they did. Um, the 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 funny thing is one the the brewery is on a farm in the middle of nowhere in the in the country in in uh, near Sparta, Tennessee, um, and so they they had converted an old barn into their brewery. Hmm. Um, in fact, they and they they bought up. Uh, stainless steel milking equipment from dairy farms that went out of business to and cobbled it together to create brewing equipment. But Sorry. you know, but, very entrepreneurial. <laughs> the brewery was right next to their home. Yeah, there's two brothers, so uh, you know, the one brother and and his wife and family lived right next door. Well, when you're right next to the office like that. Uh, it's easy to get sucked into going back and forth. And, you know, they had to, to, to maintain the balance. In fact, I, I was up there a couple of weeks ago and, and was talking to them. Uh, they got great beer, by the way, and a really funny story. But um, they uh, they had to make time. said, okay, at this point, the brewery shuts down and, and we go home. Uh, sometimes that, for some people, that's hard. But if you don't do that, if, you're, if your family life suffers, your business is going to suffer. Right. It's going to be out, out of balance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a funny thing, the difference between being balanced and having passion. And as a small business owner, mm -hmm. I know the passion is what drives mm -hmm. your business. So if mm -hmm. you don't have the passion, yeah, you just got to know when to stop. Just hold, right. you know. And it's interesting you mentioned passion too, Marjorie, because uh, I read a book one time about uh, about that, and this guy credited his success to his passion. So being the business coach, I thought, okay, how do I teach somebody to be passionate? Hmm. A lot. Do it. You we can't do it. Why. Yeah. Why am I doing this? The, well, no, you have to have it. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's I, something that it is important, but it's not a skill that can be taught. It is something that you feel inside and you feel, all right, this is the mission that God's called me to do. And I'm going to put all my efforts into it. And I think most of small businesses, if they have a trade or a passion that they like, that's what they, they live on. And mm -hmm. it's a good thing they have it because once they get into it, they realize it's mm -hmm. not nine to five, it's mm -hmm. weekends and it's, it's so much more. So that's a good thing. <laughs> You really never stop thinking about it, but you do have to. But, but it's good because we're passionate about it. You know, yeah. we love it. We know it's moving the needle for small business, you know, in, in our community. And I think that's another, you know, leads to another reason why a lot of small businesses fail. People start them because they want to work for themselves. And they're tired it's of It's a great American dream. They don't want somebody else telling them what to do and how to do it. But sometimes they get into a business that is not something that they are super passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And they burn out. You know, after a few years, I had a guy come to me one time, Marjorie, and he said, I want to buy a business. And I said, Well, what kind of business? He said, Doesn't matter. I just want to buy a business. I've retired. I've got $650,000 to invest, and I've got investors that will put in another three quarters of a million. I said, what are, you, what are you passionate about? Oh, no, I just want to buy a business. He's doomed. He is doomed. Well, how did he get $650,000? Was he an employee? It was his retirement plan that he had, you know, worked for a large corporation and he had saved this money up. Uh, and the sad part is he probably blew it on something. But I said, you know, if, if you haven't got something that, that you're passionate about, I can't really help you out here. That's really good counsel. Mm -hmm. That's super mm -hmm. good counsel. Yeah, because it is the gasoline that runs your company. Yeah. I mean, you, find, you, you may find out after a couple of years that what you've done is 
uh, you're not no, no longer working for somebody else, but you've just created a, a different kind of a job. Yeah. Uh, and you're and not working for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Roy, looking back on your career, starting your own business, what is something that you didn't know that you wish you had known when you started? Hmm. <laughs> That's a really open-end question, Marjorie. <laughs> um, you caught me. You caught me off guard here. A bit. I'm not sure. I mean, I've learned so much. Well, you're so prepared, having the MBA and the CPA and the, your background. I mean, that's why you started it because you knew all those things. You know, I think one of the one of the challenges. Uh, has been keeping up with technology mm -hmm. um and that's something uh that i had i had i was at a, a bluffton chamber meeting one time and uh this they just hired this young girl who was what 18 or 19 or 20 or something like that and uh, mm -hmm. somebody said something and i said you know it's you know as you can see here on my brochure i'm on linkedin and Facebook and Twitter, and she turned to me and said, "You're on Twitter." <laughs> you know, it's like, yes. And, and then she went, "Oh my god." <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if if you're not, uh, for, you know, moving forward, you're moving backward. And um, how do you keep up with with all the trends? What what's your best source? I think you have to be a reader. Mm -hmm. I agree. Whether you're talking about blogs or magazines or books, there's, you know, YouTube. <laughs> one of my biggest, uh, th one of the things I think hurts a lot of small businesses is say, well, I, you know, I don't like to read. Well, if you don't like to read, what you're really saying in a way is, I already know everything I need to know. Yep. And none That's of us will ever know it. I none love of us will ever know everything we need to know. We can always, you know, if you're not growing, you're decaying. Absolutely. I, I, I personally read every day and I think that mm -hmm. should be a strategy for every small business owner is to read every day. You're not, you know, you it, learn it, something every day. Make a, you make an appointment for that, whatever is <laughs> convenient for you. I mean, get to the office 10 or 15 minutes early, even if you only read a little bit. And now there's podcasts and they're so easy. Right. You can download them and listen to them mm -hmm. going to work. And uh, yeah. there's really no excuse not to be learning. No. I mean, it's a competitive advantage to be ahead of these other small business owners. And you can't just stop at, all right, I'm going to keep up with some technical things in my industry. What's the latest in the plumbing or the HVAC industry or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, you got to keep up with what are new and interesting different ways of managing the business. How can I improve on that? And that's where hiring somebody like you as a coach you can make sure you don't step on a, a landmine. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you, Roy, you have been there and done that. And I certainly appreciate you sharing some insights with the small business community. And for folks that are interested in buying his book, where do they go? Well, the, my website is alligatorbusinesssolution.com. Uh, or if you would like a signed copy, you can email me at rockwell at hargrave.com. So before we sign off, what's, what is one thing that you wish every small business owner knows? <laughs> um, I would have to say know themselves. Okay. Uh, it's not just about improving your business. It's about improving yourself. A whole life approach. Being, you know, being, you know, I've, I've got a, uh, a coffee mug I had made. In fact, the, when I sign all my books, it says, uh, uh, that simply says, be the best you that you can be. It's not about comparing yourself to somebody else. Right. There will always be other people who are more competent and more knowledgeable and more skilled in various areas than you are. The question is, are you becoming better at who you are and what you do? Uh, so compare yourself to yourself, not to other people, and be the best you that you can be. 
What beautiful words of wisdom. Thank you so much for being on Open for Business. Thank you, Marjorie. It was my pleasure. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. And we will talk to you all next time. Bye. Bye-bye.